Hi, I'm Ethan Zuckerman. I'm the director of the Center for Citizen Media at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm right now finishing a book called Rewire, Rethinking Globalization in the Age of Connection. And Ethan, what's the central proposition of the book? The central idea of the book is that the internet is the most exciting technology we've ever built to allow connection across nation, language, cultural borders, and that for the most part we're absolutely dreadful at using it. Uh, and in many ways the book tries to make this somewhat counterintuitive claim that despite the fact that it's easier and easier for us to get on the ground information from all corners of the world, we appear to be getting more and more parochial in our media consumption, both in terms of what we individually consume and also in terms of what media corporations are offering to us. The book tries to take this seriously and then says if we were to worry about that and if we were to try to fix it, what would we do uh, to, uh, to alleviate that situation? And why would you argue, I can see that, um, I can see where you're going, but why would you argue that we should be interested in what's happening in the rest of the world? I think we're hitting a point in time where many of the most interesting problems we face cannot be understood without having a massively global view of things. If we try to understand the failure of British charities, we find ourselves looking at the Icelandic banking system, which was not something anyone thought they, they needed to mm. think about. Uh, we're looking today at contemporary Russian politics and it turns out to understand what's going on in Russia, you need to understand what's happened in Egypt and what's happened in Tunisia, because the people who are protesting on the ground are deeply influenced by what's happened in Egypt and in Tunisia. It is possible to seek inspiration from any corner of the globe, and um, many of the systems that we rely on are deeply, deeply international at this point. I had a great conversation uh, a few weeks ago um, with someone who is a computer scientist who works with the, the American intelligence industry. And she said that, you know, 20 years ago, we lived in a world of secrets. We knew who was important, and we knew that the Chinese and the Russians were talking. We really wanted to know what they were saying to each other. That's all gone. We now live in a world of mysteries. Things happen. We don't quite know how they happened or why they happened. And the only possible way we can do it is not by intercepting that one little channel where we understand that the important stuff is being said. We somehow need this vast, wide view if we're going to understand politics, if we're going to understand finance, if we're going to understand health, if we're going to understand many, many aspects of the world that we're living in. But it would seem to me, and it's difficult to know whether this is push or pull, that media over the last 20 years have, in a sense, retreated from overseas coverage Yes, it exists, but it exists in ever smaller quantities and with ever less um, intelligent analysis of what is or isn't happening. This is the paradox that got me looking at this book. Um, in some ways, the high point for international news coverage uh, for the US was during the Vietnam War. And you can argue that that's because the US was involved in a long and unpopular war, and it was enormously important to the legitimacy of the government, but the U.S. has just been involved in an enormously long and unpopular war, and uh, honestly it hasn't been covered nearly as much. And, and, and when you think about the change in technology, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, we were shooting 8 and 16 millimeter film and, you know, taking the actual acetate reels and flying them back from Saigon to Los Angeles and developing them and then broadcasting them. This is a, a, a long turnaround mm. time. You can use Ustream right now on a mm. mobile phone and you can, you know, record live from anywhere you have mobile phone coverage. At the same time of this technological transformation where it's so much easier to bring the rest of the world into your living room, the amount we've seen in sort of American broadcast television of serious international reporting, there's a drop from about 40% of the news hold to about 12% of the news hold. It's a great study in the UK done by Media Standards Trust, looks at, at four of Britain's largest and most influential papers. 45% fall off 
international news coverage over the last 40 years. Something really strange is going on. I don't think anyone wants to make the argument that the world is less connected and interdependent than it was in 1979. So something else is going on. I think what else is going on is that people have decided, well, for whoever it's important that they understand China or they understand India, I, I'm sure they're getting the information. It's out there somewhere on the internet. And of course the answer is, if you take that attitude, you have now carved yourself out of the set of people who could possibly have influence around those issues or, or can really have informed opinions around those In issues. In a way, isn't foreign news, to use your phrase, a bit like broccoli, something that's good for you, but actually you'd rather not have to eat too often? Well, the, this has been my analogy to understand um, what's going on as far as people's media diets. We've now got so much more choice than we used to. When I was growing up as a kid in the States, you know, I, I was in the New York City area, so there were three newspapers to choose from, which was hmm. qu quite a selection in the U.S. Uh, and again, growing up near a, a big metropolitan area, there were four or five TV stations. You know, we're now at the point where many American households have 500 you know, cable TV stations on demand. And once you add the internet into the equation, you, you have a literal infinity. You know, reading the Times of India online is just as easy as reading the New York Times online. So you can simply choose which one you're going to go for. It's like going from the school cafeteria where the, the, the matronly lunch lady sort of mm. hands you, you know, your well you're balanced have. media, yeah. which, which, which you, you have no interest yeah. in eating, but at least you know, it's, it's nutritionally balanced, to now sort of going to this giant steam table restaurant where you can select whatever you want. And the truth of it is that most of us are very bad at knowing what's good for us. We're, we're, we're going to take the, the, the fried shrimp and the chocolate pudding, and we may not ever get the green vegetables in there. So there's the problem with this analogy is that it sort of implies eat more broccoli. You know, mm. let, let's get more broccoli in the diet. And that isn't going to work. You know, we sort of know mm. that, that making this stuff sort of mandatory, you know, it isn't helpful. Somehow, I think we need to help people look at their behaviors, try to figure out whether they're comfortable with what they're consuming in terms of media, and then help them make better choices if they're not. And how would you help them make better choices? How do you help them connect with those kind, that kind of information? Well, so... One of the nice things about my life at the moment is, is, is I have a research lab and I have graduate students and I can come in and say things like, I think we need nutritional information labeling for newspapers. And my students will sort of look at me funny for a couple of days and a week later someone will come in and say, okay, here's how I think we're going to do it. And so we're, we're working on that project. We're getting to the point where we're able for a few papers to sort of talk about what's international versus national versus entertainment versus sport and the goal sort of by the end of this academic year is to have a general system where we can take anything from the guardian to the huffington post and sort of say over this period of time uh what countries what topics what was the percentage of sort of hard versus soft national versus international uh, and be able to at least do that sort of comparison the next step beyond that is to start building tools for people to make decisions about what they want to be ingesting. Uh, so I'm sitting here, in one of my pockets is this clever little device called a Fitbit. And the Fitbit, if I can pull it out of my pocket, not fit enough to actually reach into my pockets, uh, is this little pedometer. It's tracking how many steps I take on a given day. Mm. Um, and then it syncs with my computer, and I can easily look at a chart, and I can sort of say, this was a good day, I actually mm. took a very long walk, or this was not such a good day. That whole practice of contemplating what you're doing has a tendency to change your behavior. Mm. And we've got some primitive systems up where we're letting people look at what they're reading and not reading. I read a lot about football. Uh, but when I look and see how much I read about football, it tends to make me realize, gee, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed by that. I'd like to find some other ways to read. So we're sort of thinking through these systems, both to analyze what's in and what's not in mm. 
the publications we care about, and what's in and what's not in sort of our daily encounters with it, and then helping people try to make decisions. The third thing we need to do is think very, very seriously about this idea of serendipity. Um, serendipity is not a happy accident. Serendipity is generally the result of very careful planning. Alexander Fleming didn't find penicillin because he got lucky and, and, and got a spore in one of his dishes. He's incredibly well prepared. He's mm -hmm. cultivating bacteria and sort of mm -hmm. thinking about antibiotics and such. I firmly believe that it's possible to sort of look at this world where we're getting paradoxically echo chamber, narrow parochial media and sort of say, I need better information, whether it's about telecommunications, whether it's about the energy business, whether it's about human rights, and sort of say, I'm going to be attuned to this, but I'm also going to try to figure out how I get outside of my ordinary realm of sources. I'm going to listen to people who are interested in the topic, but are very different from me, whether they differ in opinion, they differ in language, whether they differ in politics. And I'm going to start looking to mm. them sort for of counter narratives. Sort of and, and, and multiple different narratives. One yeah. of my students right now is working on a, a lovely project called The Weekly Different. And The Weekly Different tries to look at what you read on Twitter and then essentially says, okay, if you're over here on the political spectrum, we don't necessarily want to go here. You know, in my case, mm. don't find me a, a, a conservative Christian Republican maybe find me a liberal evangelical Christian, or maybe find me a highly secular libertarian Republican. Find me someone a little bit closer, but well out of my ordinary orbit, and start showing me what they find important. And, and I think that we've done so much work on the internet in helping people find their friends and finding the like-minded. If we can just invert that axis a little bit, and, and help people find people who are slightly different. You know, what are liberal secular folks in Nigeria paying attention to and finding interesting? And how would that inform how I'm looking at the world? Th those are the sorts of questions we're trying to work on. In a sense, kind of bridging gaps between relatively modest distance of difference. I think it's a mistake to look at the world and say, who is the most unlike me? And let's figure out now how to make a connection. I think connections tend to be made around mutual interests. Um, in the book that I'm writing, a surprising amount of it is about music. Uh, and it's about these wonderful old stories like Paul Simon's trip to South Africa and the Graceland album. Um, that story doesn't happen if Paul Simon isn't interested in Sowetan music. It doesn't happen if Hilton Rosenthal, this remarkable record producer who's responsible for Johnny Clegg and Savuka and sort of mm. the first black, white record albums coming out of South Africa, doesn't get involved and sort of shepherd the whole collaboration. Um, you need translation, you need bridging, you need enough mutual interest that you can get there. 